with the recent stolen elections in Pakistan, a tremendous paradigm shift has taken place in that God-benighted country, the significance of which has not yet fully been grasped neither in India nor in the rest of the world. You know, I mentioned the word stolen elections. I have lived long enough to see a stolen election in Pakistan in 1971. As we may recall, Mujibur Rahman had won a thumping majority in Pakistan in the elections in 1971. And the Pakistani military establishment, egged on by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was dead set that they would not countenance a Bengali as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. They pretended to negotiate and under the eggings of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, they then sent General Tikka Khan, Lieutenant General Tikka Khan, the so-called butcher of Bangladesh, the butcher of Baluchistan. He was sent to Dhaka to, you know, undertake a ferocious crackdown, a brutal crackdown on the poor people of uh, then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, who had dared to vote against the wishes of the Pakistani military. The Pakistani military then was counting upon a hung parliament, a fractured mandate, which would enable them to play prima donna from behind the scenes. They stole that election and they paid a horrific price. Pakistan was broken in two. Today, I can experience a feeling of deja vu. I lived through that war. I took part in that war. I, I and my batchmates of the 1971 batch were commissioned a month earlier and thrown into action. To us, the series of events has a very strong sense of deja vu. The simple fact is that the Pakistani army has gotten into a pattern. For 30 years, they had ruled Pakistan directly. Then they grew smart and they learned from their experience. For the next 45 years, they decided to be the prima donnas behind the scene, to be the puppet masters from Rawalpindi who would control events in Islamabad and the whole of what was left of Pakistan. A very familiar uh, litany, a very familiar playbook. The army selects a protege. Even Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was the protege of Ayub Khan, right? Uh, you select a protege, you build up a protege. In 71, the difference was that that protege wasn't put in place by the Pakistan army. After their, their disastrous defeat in the 1971 war, the Pakistani army had lost a great amount of sheen in Pakistan as the institution that was the bedrock of security in that country that was in a real sense the deep state. Uh, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, a great maverick political leader, took the greatest advantage of that groundswell of anger against the Pakistan army and he became the prime minister. He did his best. I think he succeeded the most in trying to cut the Pakistan army down to size. He chose General Ziaul Haq, who was, you know, who had 10 seniors above him. He went deep down, did deep selection to try and get uh, what he felt was a butler, a buffoon as the Pakistan army chief. But Bhutto had managed to deeply upset the security establishment in Washington with his quest for the nuclear bomb. In fact, Henry Kissinger had told him in unequivocal terms, we will make a horrible example out of you. They did through the agency of the Pakistan army. The butler, so-called butler, Terry Thomas equivalent of uh, General Ziaul Haq, staged a coup, deposed Bhutto, put him in jail and then hanged him. That was the end of the democratic upsurge in Pakistan for quite some time. The familiar pattern now became, you know, cast in stone. The next 
you know, selection of the Pakistan army was Nawaz Sharif, uh, fairly popular uh, politician in Punjab and uh, a protege of the next set of generals, right? He was made the prime minister and as per that familiar turn of events, after some time he felt, uh, you know, emboldened enough to try and take on his mentors. He tried to take on the Pakistan army and the most cardinal sin a Pakistani politician can make is to try and, you know, play kingmaker as far as the Pakistan army chief, the director general of the ISI to critical posts in the Pakistani deep state are concerned. Uh, as we are all, it's history now, how uh, Nawaz Sharif tried to foist a Pakistani DGISI and then having gotten the DGISI of his, chai, uh, of his choice, he tried to make him the army chief. And that was the time when Parvez Musharraf was almost compelled to make a coup. He overthrew uh, Nawaz Sharif and uh, uh, put him in jail first and then exiled him first to Saudi Arabia and then to London. So that was the end of Nawaz Sharif per se as a politician. The next election of the Pakistan army was Imran Khan. Uh, let's all remember very clearly that Imran Khan was addressed as the selected prime minister and not so much the elected prime minister of Pakistan. And once again, we find that familiar pattern, that familiar ring of deja vu in Pakistan. After some time, uh, Imran Khan felt secure enough, entrenched enough, bold enough to challenge his mentors to try and break free of the apron strings of the Pakistan army. And once again, he tried to meddle in the selection first of the DGISI. And then he had in the DGISI his candidate for the chief of the Pakistan army. That is when General uh, Bajwa stuck, struck back viciously and we found, uh, you know, uh, Imran Khan thrown out of power, replaced by the uh, PML uh, Nawaz Sharif's party, led by his brother now, Shehbaz Sharif, and uh, with a combination with the PPP, Pakistan People's Party, and Bilawal Bhutto as his number two, foreign minister to be more exact. And this time, we find a difference. There is a groundswell of resentment, popular angst and rage, almost amounting to a kind of an Arab Spring or a Pakistani Spring. I mean, there are riots all over Pakistan. There is great civil unrest for the simple reason that Pakistan was in dire economic straits. Pakistan was a country on the brink of economic collapse, state meltdown, economic meltdown, and it almost came to the state of a civil war. The home of the core commander in Lahore was attacked, ransacked, and there were attacks on the Pakistan army all over. The, the edifice in Pakistan was showing major, major cracks. But then, as per the familiar litany of events, we found the Pakistan army with its muscle power, with its uh, financial muscle through the ISI, it could purchase politicians at will, it could sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, it succeeded in putting up a facade. And once again, the Americans were quite, quite deeply upset by Imran Khan's narrative, anti-American narrative that he tried to create to win the popular uh, sentiments and the popular vote to win the youthful electorate in Pakistan. What this stolen election has highlighted so clearly is that what has happened in Pakistan is unprecedented. Imran Khan, we may like him, we may not like him. Especially we in India find him a maverick and a person very difficult to get along with not at all good for India-Pakistan relations, but that does not really matter. What matters is that for the first time 
you see the upsurge of a democratic sentiment in Pakistan amongst the youthful population of Pakistan. The demography is the same as ours. Almost 20, uh, almost 50 percent of the people of Pakistan are below the age of 26. It's possibly a slightly younger demography even than India's. And it is they who are now deeply enamored of Imran Khan. They have bought lock, stock and barrel into the narrative that he was trying to graft of how he was standing up for Pakistan and how the deep state has staged a coup against him. And by the democratic route uh, they, of a vote of no confidence, they had him uh, thrown out. And then a slew of cases has been slapped against him. The, uh, the bad symbol of the party was taken away of his uh, Tehreek Insaf Pakistan. Every kind of obstacle was put into his uh, way. And uh, he was pilloried with a, not one but a series of legal cases, given 10 years in jail and parallel uh, jail sentences in many other three cases primarily. And uh, everybody thought that he was finished. Most uh, forecasters of Pakistan, in India at least, were forecasting that it was a familiar, it was done and dusted deal. The Pakistan army had chosen its next candidate and that was Nawaz Sharif who was rehabilitated because he was seen as the lesser of the evils uh, between Imran Khan and Nawaz Sharif. He was viewed as uh, now more pliable because he had cooled his heel in exile for well over a decade and he would be uh, easier to work with. And uh, once again, the familiar Pakistani army prescription of a fractured mandate that, uh, you know, makes it easily easy for them to manipulate, to buy over uh, legislators and members of parliament, etc. and uh, run the show from behind the scenes, uh, you know, uh, promote a democratic facade and from behind the scenes control the levers of power in Pakistan, be the puppet masters. But what has happened is indeed unprecedented and surprising. One stolen election in 1971 cost Pakistan half the country. This election may spell, this stolen election, let me be specific, you know, uh, democratic observers from the United States, from Europe, etc., are all saying this is a shamelessly rigged election. Despite all the hurdles put in the way of Imran Khan, he has managed to secure 101 seats through the people that he had put up as independents. And uh, uh, with about 75, Nawaz Sharif was next and uh, uh, Bilawal Bhutto's uh, PPP was a third was in the third position. So as per democratic norms and ethics the world over, and you have a president in Pakistan who is a protege of the Tariq e Insaf party. So he is being duty bound or is duty bound to call the largest uh, uh, party with the largest uh, electoral uh, heft to come and take a crack at government formation. But they said this party has been banned, Imran Khan is in jail and it's not a party per se. So they have uh, engineered once again uh, a combination that is a continuation of what they used to dethrone Imran Khan in the first place. So we will again possibly be having Shahbaz Sharif as the Prime Minister, uh, Maryam Sharif as the Chief Minister in Punjab and, uh, and uh, 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 you know Bilawal Bhutto who made, uh, whose father made a desperate bid for him to be the Prime Minister and he wanted the President's uh, 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 chair for himself. But uh, he may have to settle for Bilawal Bhutto as the Foreign Minister once again. They have agreed. So this is the kind of coalition that the Pakistan Army is cobbling up. Uh, the Pakistan Army has already started purchasing the independent candidates. I mean, they, are, they have always been up for uh, higher purchase. And uh, uh, yes, they will possibly be able to, they will be able to install that government in Pakistan. So what's the difference? What has changed? A lot. What has changed is the popular sentiment in Pakistan. One of the holy cows in Pakistan, one of the three A's, you know, 
the army, Allah and America, not necessarily in that order, but it is the army whose image has taken a terrific beating, a terrific beating with the youth. There is a terrific sense of disenchantment with the Pakistan army, which spells trouble for Pakistan. Why trouble for Pakistan? Because there is a combination of political instability with economic meltdown. This was not hard to foresee. You know, uh, 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 Paul Kennedy in his magnum opus, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, he had put up the thesis of highly over-militarized states which have always been prone to economic collapse, economic meltdown, imperial overstretch and overreach. Pakistan is a prime candidate for this category of states. The Pakistan army has been, you know, calling the shots in Pakistan almost since its inception. The tallest political leader of Pakistan, unfortunately, did not last very long. And uh, thereafter, there was no center of political authority strong enough in Pakistan to stand up to the Pakistan army. And they took charge. And they were popular because they were seen as a force for stability a force that would ensure the protection of Pakistan. They became the ideological protectors of Pakistan and its so-called ideology. That is how Ayub Khan onwards, the Pakistani dictators, military dictators have portrayed themselves. But the second part of this military equation is that like Austria-Hungary, like Nazi Germany, like Imperial Japan, like the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. All highly over-militarized states have led their countries to economic doom, collapse and meltdown. This is precisely what the Pakistan army has brought Pakistan to. Economic collapse and meltdown. And that is a reality that is not going away. It requires extremely strong political leadership to pull Pakistan out of its debt trap, to pull Pakistan out of its absolute economic morass and chaos. Will Shahbaz Sharif be that political leader? Will he be able to take those harsh economic decisions, unpopular economic decisions? I have very grave doubts on that score. I am not at all certain that the dispensation that the Pakistan army puts in place could last optimistically more than a year or year and a half because of their failure to be able to put in those structural economic reforms in place. There will be chaos in Pakistan. The hungry and angry people of Pakistan who can't get two square meals a day and already incensed by their stolen verdict, their stolen election in Pakistan. Uh, you know, it has been rigged and rigged with a vengeance. And if, uh, uh, if despite all these constraints, Imran Khan has still emerged as the largest single elected party. I mean, uh, uh, I think his allegation that had the rigging not taken place, he could have he would certainly have won a clear majority and possibly even a very strong majority, far higher than the uh, bare minimum, uh, you know, uh, uh, majority that is required to form a government. Even two-thirds majority is what he is claiming. Well, that election has been stolen. The Pakistan army is clearly seen as having stolen this election. It's not going to add to the popularity of the Pakistan army. And what we saw when Imran Khan was dethroned, was a massive popular movement of upsurge and anger. That anger was fueled by hunger. That anger was fueled by the economic distress of the people of Pakistan. That distress has not gone away. So you may rig the elections. You may cobble up a very favorable, uh, as, you know, as per the reckoning of the Pakistan army, a very favorable political combination to rule in Islamabad. 
but will that be able to alleviate the economic distress of the people of Pakistan? The answer is a resounding no. And economic distress coupled with political instability is a very dangerous prescription. And if there is a kind of an Arab Spring that you see in Pakistan, I would not be too surprised. For the first time we had seen in May last an attack on the house of a core commander. The hungry and angry people of Pakistan invaded the house of that core commander. His guard and a pretty strong company, strong guard just melted away. They robbed, opened his fridge, robbed it of all the exotic fruit. He had the white peacocks in his lawns. They took them away to slaughter and eat them. That is the level of hunger in Pakistan. And the biggest problem is that there were dissensions for the first time in the Pakistan army itself. There was a strong pro-Imran Khan lobby within the Pakistan army per se. Whether General Munir will be able to paper over these cracks in the, in, the, in the army establishment itself, in the deep state itself, is a matter of conjecture. I am not very certain he will be able to do that because next comes the factor of demographic. So far, the people in open revolt in Pakistan have been the Baluch and the Sindhis and to some extent the Shias of Gilgit, Baltistan. But the fact is, demographically, they are not strong. They are pretty weak. They are, they are ineffectual minorities. The people in Baluchistan, they are living, they are, they are uh, ethnically, they are a very small, man, uh, small minority in terms of the overall demographic lineup of Pakistan. And then they are operating in a desert open desert with no cover, no dense jungles to provide hideouts. And to that extent, any Baluch insurgency in the long term, the chances of success are a question mark. Uh, though they are doing much better this time than possibly previously. But it is the Pashtun demographic that is far more dangerous, far larger and has a fair the Pashtun Punjabi combination has run the army in Pakistan ever since its inception. They are not pushovers exactly. And now what is happening in Afghanistan with the installation of the Taliban and the Taliban could be counted upon to be xeno, uh, xenophobic. The simple fact is that when there was this uh, Taliban occupation, when they came to power in Kabul, there was triumphalism in Pakistan. They felt the Pakistan army, to be more precise, they felt they had acquired the strategic depth, the strategic heft that they had always aspired for, salivated for. They felt that Pakistan now had Afghanistan as a proxy state, as a puppet that they could control, kick around at will. I'm afraid any self-respecting Pashtun government in Kabul will strongly resist this. There is that strong, strong antipathy between the hill tribes and the people of the plains in Pakistan. It is like the Scots versus the British. There will always be those strong, you know, hill versus plains kind of fissures. And these are now in plain sight. The Taliban is refused to recognize the Durand line. The Taliban is you know, asserting itself. It has been very well armed by the leftover arms, you know, very conveniently left behind by the American army before its uh, panic withdrawal, rather shameful withdrawal from Kabul, fly out from Kabul, which was almost reminiscent of what had happened in Saigon earlier. And uh, with this kind of a lineup, uh, Afghanistan feels it is not a pushover. Economically, it may be a paria state, absolutely destroyed. Uh, uh, politically, it has not been able to, the Taliban has not been able to provide a government which, uh, you know, helps the representation of the minorities and the women, etc. And it is anti-modernist in the extreme, but it is still the government calling the shots in Kabul. It refuses to recognize 
the, 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 it refuses to recognize the Durand line and it has been supportive of the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan and uh, the, the chaos that we are seeing in that area, the strong insurgency against the Pakistan army is uh, something which is uh, unprecedented in Pakistan's history. And for all their, uh, you know, uh, 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 massive operations to subdue the Pashtuns. And there were grand affairs, you know, very, very uh, grand military operations using artillery, using the F-16 fighter bombers, etc. But they have failed to subdue the Pashtuns. Imran Khan is a Pashtun. Let's get that right. The new demographic fault lines that we are seeing in Pakistan are not just the Baluch and the Shias of Gilgit, Baltistan against the Punjabis, but it is the Pashtuns versus the Punjabis, which can be the worst kind of a uh, fault line to hit Pakistan in its entire existence of 75 years. I see trouble ahead for Pakistan. Serious trouble. A combination of economic meltdown with political uncertainty leading possibly to a civil war. My heart bleeds for the people of Pakistan, but I am glad that whatever their choice, they now seem to have a popular, uh, somebody with a popular heft to give the Pakistan army a run for its money. That is significantly different. That is radically different from the scenario so far in Pakistan. The deep state has taken a knock. The deep state has lost its shine in Pakistan. The deep state has lost the popular support in amongst the youth and the people of Pakistan. And that what spells serious danger for the Pakistani state. It is a nuclear armed state. And this level of instability in a nuclear armed state is dangerous not just for South Asia. It spells serious trouble for the rest of the world because they have the largest segment of jihadi terrorist organizations in Pakistan, closely allied with the Pakistan army. And if they get hold, if the Pakistani, if the center weakens, and this by the center I imply the deep state in Pakistan, the military ISI combination, shows internal cracks, dissensions, and, you know, they don't like to be at the receiving end of popular ire. They see themselves as the defenders of Pakistan, extremely popular with the people of Pakistan. And it is a new experience for them to be at the receiving end of the rage and ire of a hunger, of the hunger of the people of Pakistan. No political set up that they have been able to uh, cobble up in Islamabad has been competent enough to run the economy of Pakistan for the simple reason that the Pakistan army demands an excessively large share, is not prepared to take any cuts in the defense budget and as an over militarized state, it has pushed the Pakistani state to collapse. It is the Pakistan army which is the root cause of all the problems in Pakistan. There are trouble times ahead. What we are seeing in Pakistan, a paradigm shift in Pakistan's political milieu. Unprecedented political shift. The last such turbulence we had seen was in 1971. Will 1971 be replicated now with a combination of economic distress economic meltdown and political instability? Will we see multiple, a million mutinies, multiple mutinies, civil war and worse? Pakistan is heading for serious trouble because whatever be the independent number of independents, they win over, buy over to create a new political dispensation in Islamabad that will forever be beholden to the army, at the mercy of the army. They will have to be the fall guys because the economic distress is not going away in a hurry. 
this political dispensation has shown itself incapable of handling the political malaise, the political problems, the, 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 the economic malaise and the economic meltdown in Pakistan that calls for very harsh, very unpopular decisions. I don't see such a weak government taking those decisions. Therefore, the economic distress will persist. The economic distress will fuel political unrest that will manifest itself increasingly on the Pakistani street. It will be also a combination of Pashtun irredentism against the Punjabis. And the, if there is a Pashtun Punjabi fault line coming up in Pakistan, and I repeat, Imran Khan is a Pashtun. Imran Khan Niazi is a Pashtun. And to that extent, he can, he can deepen that fault line. He may not come back to power. He may not be allowed to come back to power. He can certainly create a great deal of trouble for the deep state in Pakistan. Thank you.